We often see patients with classic anginal pain, but when we look into the coronary arteries, there are no blockages. We call this angina with no obstructive coronary arteries or ANOCA, and we dedicated an entire episode to diagnosing managing ANOCA. But what if the presentation is more dramatic? What if a patient comes in with all the hallmarks of a myocardial infarction, crushing chest pain, signs of ischemia, troponin elevation? Our instinct, of course, is to rush them to the cath lab because we assume that there is a blocked artery that needs immediate treatment. Sometimes, despite all the evidence pointing to a myocardial infarction, the coronary angiogram reveals no significant obstruction in the major epicardial arteries. This is a distinct entity of myocardial infarctions, and we call it myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, or MINOCA. In this episode, we'll be bringing together insights from the literature, including registries, guidelines, and our own clinical experience to demystify MINOCA. Welcome to CardioBuzz. Welcome back to Cardio Buzz, the essential channel for doctors looking to stay informed in cardiology. Whether you're a seasoned physician looking to quickly catch up on critical updates or a fellow building a robust foundation, our videos offer the perfect balance of detail and efficiency. Don't miss out. Subscribe now and make Cardio Buzz your trusted resource. In this episode, we'll break down MINOCA, the etiologies, diagnostic evaluation, and management strategies. Let's start first by the incidence. How common is it to have a full-blown myocardial infarction without obstructive coronary disease? You might be surprised to find that MINOCA is more common than what we think. It's observed in a significant proportion of acute coronary syndromes, with an incidence ranging from 5% to 15%. Then MINOCA is not uncommon. Are there differences between MINOCA patients and patients with obstructive coronary MI? We know from a meta-analysis of thousands of patients that there are significant differences between MINOCA and the classic myocardial infarction patients. MINOCA patients are more likely to be younger, twice as likely to be females, more likely to be of African origin, and less likely to have hyperlipidemia. Female gender is particularly well represented in MINOCA than in other acute coronary syndromes. It's more common in the premenopausal period, and 40% of MINOCA patients in the largest meta-analysis were females. Is there a special definition for MINOCA isn't just a subset of myocardial infarction? Before we define MINOCA, we need to understand the universal definition of a myocardial infarction, because MINOCA is a subset of myocardial infarction. To diagnose myocardial infarction, we need two things, myocardial injury and myocardial ischemia. So let's break down myocardial injury first. Simply put, it's an elevation of cardiac biomarkers, with troponin being the most commonly used and reliable. Troponin should not exist in the blood. It's released in the blood when myocardium is injured or stressed. This troponin elevation can stem from many causes. Some are non-cardiac, like sepsis, kidney disease, pneumonia, chemotherapy. Others are cardiac, like myocardial infarction and myocarditis. This injury can be chronic, means that there is a persistent rise of troponin, and the injury can be acute, showing a rise and a fall of the marker. This acute injury is the first crucial criterion for a diagnosis of MINOCA. So we can diagnose a myocardial infarction just with troponin elevation, right? Absolutely not. In addition to troponin elevation, we need evidence of myocardial ischemia. We need chest pain, dyspnea, ECG changes, wall motion abnormalities on imaging, or finding a thrombus during angiography. When we combine myocardial ischemia with troponin elevation, we can confirm a myocardial infarction. Based on the universal definition of myocardial infarction, there are at least five types of MI. Type 1 MI, that's the most common, spontaneous myocardial infarction due to atherothrombotic coronary disease caused by plaque rupture, erosion, or fissuring with subsequent thrombus formation. Type 2 MI is an imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and myocardial demand due to conditions like anemia, hypotension, tachyarrhythmias, without an acute atherothrombotic event. Type 3 MI, that's sudden death, with previous symptoms suggestive of myocardial ischemia or new ECG changes, but the patient dies before cardiac biomarkers are obtained or have seen elevated. Type 4 MI is related to percutaneous coronary intervention, 4A is during or after PCI, 4B is due to stent thrombosis, and 4C is due to stent restenosis. Type 5 MI is related to coronary artery bypass graft. So MINOCA can be any of the five MI types, right? 
Types 4 and 5 are out because they involve clear interventions and clear epicardial disease. Type 3 is also excluded as it deals with patients who have already died. This leaves us with type 1 MI and type 2 MI as potential candidates for Minoka. However, the most recent definition of Minoka specifically excludes type 2 MI when there is a clear cause of supply-demand mismatch, arrhythmia, sepsis, anemia, or hypotension. If such a clear cause exists, it's a type 2 MI, it's not Minoka. Therefore, Minoka is a subgroup of type 1 MI. I got a little bit confused. So what is the correct definition of Minoka? Minoka, by definition, is a myocardial infarction, myocardial ischemia with troponin elevation, in the absence of significant coronary obstruction, after excluding other causes for the acute presentation. And we can classify the causes of Minoka into two broad categories, atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic. Let's start by atherosclerotic causes. Atherosclerotic causes are the most common. These are processes related to the atherosclerotic plaques that can complicate without causing a significant obstruction but can still lead to myocardial injury. Atherosclerotic causes roughly account for two-thirds of Minoka cases. The most common mechanisms include plaque disruption, plaque rupture, erosion, calcified nodule. These result in distal embolization or a transient thrombotic occlusion without a clear epicardial obstruction. Of course, these disrupted plaques can be identified with intracoronary imaging techniques. And what about non-atherosclerotic causes? Coronary thromboembolism, that's a small percentage of Minoka cases where emboli originate from thrombi in systemic arteries in the cardiac valves or chambers. They can also result from hereditary or acquired thrombotic disorders like hereditary thrombophilia. Thrombophilia screening in patients with Minoka has reported a 14% prevalence of these thrombophilic conditions. Coronary spasm is responsible for 2% of Minoka cases can be epicardial or microvascular. Coronary microvascular dysfunction can be a cause of Minoka. Spontaneous coronary dissection, which is a non-traumatic, non-atherosclerotic, and non-iatrogenic dissection of the epicardial coronary. While spontaneous coronary dissection can cause more than 50% luminal reduction, then it was not a Minoka. There will be cases of spontaneous dissection that do not show clear angiographic obstruction, and they can be rare causes of Minoka. Okay, I understood. But what would be the differential diagnosis of Minoka? Yes, we need to stress the word true when discussing Minoka. This is because we have false Minoka, or what we call the Minoka mimicker. The recent definition of Minoka specifically excludes myocardial infarction due to non-ischemic causes. But these are not Minoka. These are Minoka mimickers. They fulfill the standard criteria of a myocardial infarction, chest pain, dyspnea, ECG changes, swollen motion abnormalities, troponin elevation, and there's no significant coronary stenosis, but they are still not Minoka. These are Minoka mimickers. And what are these Minoka mimics? The most common among these Minoka mimickers is myocarditis. Myocarditis presents acutely with chest pain or dyspnea, ECG changes that can be diffuse or territorial, and troponin elevation. Myocarditis is the primary differential diagnosis when we're considering Minoka and can be confirmed only by biopsy or by cardiac MRI. Stress-induced cardiomyopathy, again, can be a big Minoka mimicker and differentiation can be challenging. We usually see Takotsubo cardiomyopathy in women postmenopausal after an emotional trigger or an acute stressful situation. They present with chest pain, ECG abnormalities, and troponin elevation, although troponin elevations are relatively lower in Takotsubo compared to a typical myocardial infarction. And when we do coronary angiography, there is no obstructive coronary disease. When we do imaging, there are no atherosclerotic plaque ruptures. Other cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic, dilated, restrictive cardiomyopathies, can mimic Minoka with chest pain and troponin elevation. A meticulous echocardiogram should establish the diagnosis. If echo is not informative enough, cardiac MRI can reveal the cardiomyopathy. Non-cardiac Minoka mimickers, conditions like pulmonary embolism and pneumonia, can cause chest pain, ECG changes, and troponin elevation with normal coronary angiogram. Therefore, the clinical workup of Minoka should follow two key directions. Number one, exclude the Minoka mimickers. Number two, examine the coronaries for plaque-related pathologies. It's crucial to note that even after a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation with coronary imaging, cardiac MRI, and other investigations, the underlying cause of Minoka can remain unidentified in up to one quarter of the cases. Then, 
How should we approach the situation where a full-blown MI ends up having no significant coronary blocks? The diagnostic workup of Minoka goes through a step-by-step -step approach. It all starts with your clinical sense. When you're called to see a patient with symptoms and signs of ischemia and troponin elevation, you need to use your clinical senses right away. History and clinical context, what's the story? What are the findings on physical examination? Read the ECG meticulously. Get a good echo and do the basic laboratory workup for anemia, D-dimer, inflammatory markers, liver functions, kidney functions, and thyroid screening. This initial clinical approach is paramount for diagnosing sepsis, anemia, cerebrovascular accidents, bleeding, pneumonia, kidney disease, thyroid disease, or other potential causes of type 2 MI that must be excluded even before considering Minoka. ECG can reveal signs of pericarditis, myocarditis, signs of stress cardiomyopathy, acute corpulmonen suggesting lung pathology. Echocardiography is essential for all Minoka patients because of its wide availability, low risk, low cost, and the significant information it provides, such as diagnosing the Minoka mimickers like myocarditis or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. By the end of this initial encounter, you should be able to rule out type 2 MI, manage any supply-demand mismatch, get clues on potential mimickers, and make a decision on invasive management. Are you taking this patient to the cath lab or managing the patient conservatively? Okay, let's start by the case where the patient is taken to the cath lab. If you choose an invasive pathway, for instance, a STEMI patient where you rush in the middle of the night for a primary PCI, we perform the angiogram and we don't find significant lesions or we find less than 50% lesions, at this point, ideally, we should perform a coronary imaging with intravascular ultrasound or optical coherence tomography at the time of the index coronary angiography. Should we do IUS or OCT? We prefer OCT because of its superb image resolution. With OCT, we can clearly visualize plaques, ruptures, erosions, caps of the plaque, and even differentiate white thrombi from red thrombi. IVUS is good, it has deeper penetration, but it has lower resolution, and it ultimately comes down to what's available in your cath lab. But OCT will be able to diagnose more Minoka pathologies than IVUS. In several cohorts, OCT was able to identify a culprit for Minoka in 45 to 70 percent of the cases. A thin cap fibroatheroma in 30 percent, black rupture in 15 to 50 percent, black erosion in 10 to 15 percent, calcified nodules from 1 percent to 2 percent. Interestingly, calcified nodules were much less common in Minoka patients than in patients with MI due to obstructive disease. Interestingly, when performing systemic intracoronary imaging, especially in women, we find special types of atherosclerotic plaques in Minoka patients with intraplaque hemorrhage, layered plaques signifying repetitive cycles of disruption and healing. These are common in women. Okay, what if we do OCT and don't find plaque disruptions? If we don't find plaques by OCT, then we can consider provocative testing by injecting acetylcholine this can reveal the classic response of epicardial spasm or the response of microvascular spasm that we have described in the episode of ANOCA workup. Classically, we do the provocative testing a few weeks after the acute myocardial infarction, but some studies have shown the safety of performing the test within 48 hours of diagnosis. Even in emergency cases, adverse event rates were similar to non-emergency cases. So provocative testing can be performed in Minoka patients and will reveal some cases of coronary spasm. Great. What if the patient is not taken to the cath lab? If you've chosen a non-invasive pathway for any reason, patient preference or medical justification, then two key tests are needed, CT angiography and cardiac MRI. CT angiography to diagnose coronary pathologies and cardiac MRI to diagnose Minoka and Minoka mimickers. And again, it's best to perform these tests as early as possible to avoid missing the potential diagnostic window for small infarctions or mild myocarditis. When we combine cardiac MRI with OCT, the etiology of Minoka can be successfully identified in up to 75 to 85% of cases. Cardiac MRI plays a central role in Minoka diagnosis because of multiple strengths. MRI provides high resolution imaging and allows the visualization of subtle wall motion abnormalities. MRI's tissue characterization is superb. It allows to differentiate acute MI from myocarditis. And we rely on late gadolinium enhancement and detection of myocardial edema. Late gadolinium enhancement is used to evaluate myocardial necrosis and fibrosis. It can detect as little as one gram of infarct or injured myocardium. 
Late gadolinium enhancement in a subendocardial or transmural pattern suggests ischemia, and its regionality can identify the culprit vascular territory. And when we find multifocal gadolinium enhancement, it suggests coronary emboli, where a subepicardial late gadolinium enhancement suggests a non ischemic injury. When we couple that with finding edema or inflammation, we clearly diagnose myocarditis. Myocardial edema, when present in a coronary distribution using T2 based sequences, confirms the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, whereas edema without late gadolinium enhancement suggests coronary spasm or Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. We have discussed the etiology, workup, differential diagnosis, but haven't discussed the management. The treatment approach for Minoka is complex and heavily depends on the underlying cause. All patients with Minoka should be referred to a cardiac rehabilitation program because this has been an independent predictor of favorable cardiovascular outcomes. Cardiac rehabilitation helps with weight loss, smoke cessation, which is a coronary therapy stone for Minoka and microvascular disease, helps a healthy diet, and helps exercise. And these are all beneficial for Minoka patients. For plaque erosion or plaque disruption, the treatment is similar to myocardial infarction. Aspirin is essential. P2Y inhibitor like clopidogrel ticagrelor. If there is a plaque rupture seen or suspected, then dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended for one year, followed by single antiplatelet therapy for life. ACE inhibitors and beta blockers can be used, although the evidence is weak. Statins to reduce LDL provide benefits in patients with plaque disruption because they limit disease progression in addition to their favorable effects in stabilizing high-risk plaques. For coronary spasm, you can refer to the episode of ANOCA. We use calcium antagonists and nitrates. For coronary microvascular disease, we've explained that in details in the ANOCA episode. We can discuss combining beta blockers, calcium antagonists, phenolazine, other antianginal agents, improving endothelial dysfunction with statins and ACE inhibitors. For coronary embolism, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, valve thrombus or intracardiac thrombus. Whenever there is a patent for amen ovale or atrial septal defect, they must be closed. Referral to hematology if we suspect acquired or hereditary thrombophilia. For unidentified causes of minoca, then the treatment is more or less by trial and error. We consider statins, ACE inhibitors, ARB, beta blockers, dual antiplatelet therapy. We do not have solid evidence to support the use of these agents in Minoka of an unidentified cause. Final question. What is the prognosis of Minoka? Is it grim as the infarctions with coronary blocks? Minoka patients generally have a more favorable prognosis than those with obstructive coronary disease, but still their outcomes are significantly worse than the general population without a history of MI. The rates of mortality or non-fatal MI associated with Minoka are between 4 and 5%, which is more than twice that for patients without previous atherosclerotic events. The prognosis of Minoka is heterogeneous and heavily influenced by the underlying cause. Cardiac MRI is also of prognostic value in Minoka patients, and the findings can be used to stratify the risk of major adverse events. A diagnosis of cardiomyopathy by MRI has the worst prognosis, followed by an MRI diagnosis of MI, and then myocarditis or a normal cardiac MRI probably has the best prognosis. Thanks so much for tuning in to CardioBuzz today. We really hope you found our chat about Minoka helpful and insightful. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your fellow healthcare heroes. And if you're not already part of the CardioBuzz family, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on future deep dives into the fascinating world of cardiology. Catch you next time on CardioBuzz. Stay heart smart.